Now, would you join me in your Bibles in Acts chapter 17? Acts 17, we are continuing our series in this book that tells us how God sends not only his earliest followers, but how he sends us into a changing culture to proclaim and to live uh, the truth of the good news, the gospel of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 17, we find uh, Paul going, along with his associates, going to several places. He goes to Thessalonica and to Berea. And in both of those places, he finds a, a mixed response to his message, where some accept and enjoy and celebrate this good news. Others oppose it, even to the point of rioting. And then in the second half of the chapter, uh, Paul comes to the great city of Athens, this cultural center of the ancient uh, world, and I will begin reading in verse 16, but before we come to our scripture, I want to invite you to join me in this prayer as we approach God's word together. Open my eyes and I shall see, incline my heart, and I shall desire, order my steps, and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments. Open my eyes, and I shall see, incline my heart, and I shall desire, order my steps, and I shall walk in the ways of your commandments. Acts 17, verse 16, hear now the word of the Lord. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for... In him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. 
So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Let's pray. Father, help us now to trust that these words are from you, and because they are from you, they are words of life for us. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive what you say and to receive the work of your spirit now and to be changed by him. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we are privileged to live in the age of Pixar movies. And one of my favorite, and in my opinion, one of the best of those movies is one of the early ones, uh, the movie Ratatouille. And one of the reasons that I love that movie, one of the things that makes that movie great is the character of Anton Ego the villainous restaurant critic who sneers at the motto that everyone can cook, who who pans and downgrades uh, Gusteau's restaurant and ruins his career as a chef. Anton Ego embodies elitism and snobbery and everything that we love to hate about critics. Because no one likes a critic, right? Well, that's a problem for us this morning uh, because in our text, as Paul enters this cultural center of the ancient world, he enters kind of like Anton Ego. He enters as a critic. He uh, finds much not to like, and he lets them know about it. And by the end of the passage, he is committing the worst modern sin there is He has become judgmental. He's talking about judgment. And this pattern is not unique to this part of our passage. It is a pattern that happens again and again in the book of Acts. As the word about Jesus comes into a city, into a culture, into an individual life, it comes in part as a critic. The gospel challenges the cultural status quo. It confronts accepted ideas and beliefs and values and habits. So powerful is this critique that earlier in chapter 17 in the city of Thessalonica, the Christians there are are accused of turning the world upside down. But no one likes a critic, right? So what do we do with this aspect of the gospel? I think we need to ask this morning, Why should we listen? Why should we respond to the critical message of Paul and this gospel that he proclaims? And I want to bring that question to this text. And we'll find that we should listen to gospel criticism because it reveals a search and then redirects that search. So first of all, it reveals a search. Before Paul speaks, he goes on an architectural tour of the city of Athens. He sees the sights. And then when he begins to talk, he talks about one particular piece of architecture from that city. The altar to the unknown God. Now why does Paul do that? Well, on the one hand, altars symbolize a search. They symbolize a deep human search that we all share. Altars represent our desire to connect to something ultimate, something or someone transcendent. 
the smoke that rises from altars is the human reaching for something or someone beyond our limitations that can bring order and stability and meaning to our lives in a world that is often unpredictable, chaotic, and confusing. Now, the city of Athens was, was full of, author, of altars. Uh, Paul says, I see you are very religious. Why does he pick this particular altar? Well, because all the other altars would have been connected to an image or to the name of some god in the Greek pantheon or to a deity from one of the cultures that the very pluralistic Roman Empire had embraced. But this altar was different. There was no image. There was no name. And in that empty space where the image should have done, and that, in that unknown where there should have been a name, Paul finds something very significant. Paul points out the truth that not only are we searching, But in all of our searching, we are lost. For all of the cultural and philosophical and intellectual and religious accumulation of the Athenians, with apologies to Bono, they still hadn't found what they were looking for. That's what that altar to the unknown God represents. It represents this desiring, this reaching that is still unfulfilled. It represents the unmet longing for the unknown God. And as the gospel enters any city, any culture, any life, that's where it starts. It starts by saying, can't you see that you're searching, but in all of your searching on your own, you're still lost. In all of your desiring, you are still unfulfilled. Stephen King was on Fresh Air with Terry Gross last week, and they were joking about how this pandemic is like living in a Stephen King novel. And at one point in the conversation, King was reflecting on his stories, and and he was talking about how, how his stories often deal with what is strange, with some strange being, usually an evil force, interrupting people's lives. But he said, even with all this strangeness, he said, my stories still have a rationality to them because they have a plot and, and things happen for a reason in my stories. And usually there's, there's some sort of restoration of some kind of normality. And then he sighed and he said, but I don't think we live in a rational universe. Do you hear that tension? It is a tension that our culture lives with. On the one hand, the modern assumption that we do not live in a rational universe. But on the other hand, authors like Stephen King still writing plots still writing stories with a rationality to them and we still read them and we still watch them and we still spend a lot of money doing so. Why? Well, because we want there to be a plot. 
We want to belong to a significant and meaningful narrative. And that tension is the smoke rising from the altar to the unknown God. And this is what gospel criticism wants us to see, wants us to know about ourselves and our family members and our neighbors and our coworkers. It wants us to know that we were born to a quest, to a search for something significant. But on our own, we're lost and unfulfilled. But I'm so glad that the gospel doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't just observe this search. He doesn't just notice this tension. He does something with it. Because gospel criticism not only reveals a search, it also redirects that search. Paul takes this tension. He takes this symbol And he makes it part of a plot. He takes the altar to the unknown God and he connects it to the story of the God who has made himself known. The God who has made himself known in creation. See, the reason you search is that you were made to be found. This is what Paul is saying. He is saying you were made to belong, to love and be loved by your unseen transcendent maker. You were created for that. And in verse 28, he draws from Greek literature like he had drawn from Greek architecture. And he says, you have a faint memory of that. You have an instinct instinct towards that. Because even your poets have said, in him we live and move and have our being. We are his offspring. You were made to want that by your creator. But here's the problem. Paul says you live forgetting that memory. You live in contradiction to that instinct. This is what sin has done to us. Sin, the brokenness of sin, causes us to turn from our maker to what we can make, to what human culture can make. And we give our trust, we give our allegiance, we bring our desires to the products of human culture rather than the person of our creator. And that's why we're we're still lost. That's why we're still reaching and unfulfilled. And so Paul continues the story. He continues the story from the God who made himself known in creation to the same God who will make himself known in judgment. And why judgment? Why does Paul talk about judgment in this context? Well, it's not just a rhetorical scare tactic. No, he talks about judgment because in contrast to the altar to the unknown God, in contrast to that altar that reveals our confused search for God, judgment reveals God's clear search for us. How can I say that? Well, in verse 16, it says, that Paul was provoked in his spirit by the idols in the city of Athens. That word provoked is the word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament that describes God's own response to the idolatry of his people. 
The Old Testament says that God was provoked to jealousy as his people turned to other gods. God was provoked to the jealousy of a husband who desires the exclusive love of his wife. And so when God comes in judgment, that is a movement of desire. God is desiring the hearts, the love of his people. And so he comes to remove all rivals, all false loves, all false worships, so that true love and belonging and trust and worship can come into being in the lives of those whom he loves. So see, this promised future judgment is God's definitive quest to reclaim and remake his creation and those made in his image. That's why Paul talks about judgment in this context. Because in the midst of our confused search, we need to hear about God's search for us. And can you see Paul's rationale? He says, if God is coming to make himself known by removing all rival loves, then what should you do now? If that's the end of the story, what should you do in the middle of the story? Well, you should turn away from those rivals. You should repent. You should redirect your searching to the one who will come searching for you. You should redirect your desires to the one who desires your love and your trust and your worship. But how do we know that this story that Paul tells isn't just a Stephen King novel? How do we know that this isn't just a made-up plot? And more importantly, why should we respond to this story in such a life-redefining way? Well, What did we say at the beginning of our service? What was our call to worship? Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. It is still Easter in the book of Acts. And it is the resurrection of Jesus that demonstrates, that gives us the assurance that this story is not only true, but it is good, it is beautiful, it is powerful, and it should utterly reorient our lives. See, in Jesus, God came searching for us. He came to seek and save those who are lost. In Jesus, the judge, that future judge, entered the courtroom and was judged on our behalf, suffered the curse of our idolatry. In Jesus, that future of God's quest to reclaim and remake all things, that future began when Jesus walked out of the tomb. And it has begun in the lives of all who belong to him by faith. So here's why we need to hear the gospel critique. It is because that message puts in front of us this beauty this life-changing story. And then it asks us, how will you respond? 
where will your search lead you? Where will you invite those who are searching around you? How or where do you reach in this unsettling time? Where do you reach for order, for meaning, for stability? Will you reach to the futility of what you can make, of what others can make? Or will you reach towards the one who's not only made you, but who died and rose to remake you? In the confusion of your search, will you let yourself be found by the love of the Father revealed in his Son, Jesus? One of the reasons I love the character of Anton Ego in the movie Ratatouille is that as a villain, he is not destroyed. He's not killed or defeated. No, as a villain, he's not destroyed. He is converted. He returns to the restaurant and the rat chef Remy serves him the traditional dish of Ratatouille. And as the critic tastes the first bite of that meal, he is transported back to his childhood where he experienced through that dish the comfort and love of his mother. And instead of writing a scathing review, he risked his career to write a rave, inviting all all of Paris to, this, to the table of this unexpected chef. The Apostle Paul is a critic like that. He was converted by the taste of home, the transformative belonging to God, the God who had made himself known in Jesus. And he looks at us and he, and he doesn't only point out the lostness of our searching. No, he, he invites us to be found at the table of grace where we taste the life and love of our Father through Jesus. Who wouldn't love and listen to a critic like that? Let's pray. Father, would you help us to hear this criticism? Would you help us to hear the message of the gospel showing us our lostness, but then also showing us how we can be found? Would you bring us in our hunger, in our pain, in our desiring, and in our confusion to the table of your grace? Would you bring us by faith into this great story that you are telling and help us to know your love and then help us to respond with our trust, our worship, and our love for you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's now respond to the truth of God's word, embracing the story that he tells and our place in it as we confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.